As the 1950s dawned, without warning, a menace from another world emerged, sending shockwaves right to the heart of the British government. Creating a sense of fear so great, the situation demanded the attention of the highest office of power. Capturing headlines and the public's imagination, the world's mightiest military leaders were put on a state of red alert. There have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. The potential threat was perceived so grave that if it proved to be real, it would cause chaos and mass panic. I saw this brilliant object. It was quite low in the sky. From 20 million light years away. I don't know what to think, but it's so unusual. We've got to carry on investigating. Visitors from another world. So I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. And they come in peace. I think that some of them may be friendly and some may not. Or would they be our greatest foe? How many people here tonight are afraid of the thing? Secret government investigations into these matters are only now being made public. Deep beneath the Public Records Office lie thousands of previously unseen government files. Recently, there's been a, a dramatic increase in the number of old UFO documents uh, coming forward into the public domain. Over the past few years, we've seen the release of uh, documents which at the time had been classified top secret on UFOs. Now, this sounds like it's something straight out of the X-Files. These top secret files contain details of extensive investigations carried out into the flying saucer phenomenon. With a few exceptions, all the intelligence agencies who released these documents hitherto denied having any involvement or any documentation on UFO investigations. With the release of this information into the public domain, the truth about the British government's involvement is finally about to be revealed. In 1943, aircraft from Bomber Command uh, encountered small balls of light and, in some cases, metallic discs while on raids over Germany. The Ministry of Defence denied any interest in the pilot sightings. Released files reveal, however, that behind closed doors, they believed they could be evidence of some Nazi secret weapon. There was speculation um, early on, after 1947-1948, when the, the early rash of UFOs were appearing in the States, on the basis of, well, if they could produce V1 and V2 so far ahead of our technology, our rocket technology, could they have gone on to build flying saucers? It was generally speaking under the auspices of the SS that people were supposedly planning and building these devices. It seems that in the 1950s, the SS was as powerful a term as it is now. Uh, they could have been responsible for anything dangerous or risky, but they would have the funds and the drive to make it happen. Intelligence pointed towards the Nazi development of an extraordinary form of circular flying craft. These were claimed to have been manufactured by slave laborers under the guidance of one of Hitler's greatest scientific minds. An Austrian uh, by the name of uh, Victor Schauberger, he was approached by a group of German engineers and scientists in, in 1943, for parts of his research, uh, the, the Germans were very interested in, in something that had developed. There have been various sort of semi-biographical works of him in which what appear to have been parts of a turbine he designed were photographed with a sort of Nazi insignia on them uh, and these were put around as being proof that the Nazis designed flying saucers. On one occasion it's rumoured that this device actually shot up 30 foot uh, into the air and crashed through his laboratory ceiling. Schauberger is convinced that the, the flying saucers that, that people report today and in the 40s were, were based on his work. There are those who doubt that a Nazi flying saucer program ever existed, but the files show that after the war, intelligence was gathered on individuals suspected of being associated with such a project. 
the documents involving the scientists are real, and all these people were associated with the project. And it's another indication that, 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 you know, something real was happening there. Informants cited in the files claimed that towards the end of the war, the project was moved to aerodromes on the outskirts of Germany and Czechoslovakia. I interviewed a, a chap who used to take spare parts to Pragabelli. Now, he told me in one of the, the hangars, he actually witnessed this particular aircraft, which he said it was so light you could actually push it around. There was nothing under the ground. It was actually hovering. A couple of years later, this intelligence officer telephoned me and said that there was a, a chap who used to be actually based at Prague Gabelli. And one summer's afternoon, he and, uh, and a few of his colleagues were out in the aerodrome and they uh, looked across approximately a quarter of a mile away. And there, uh, the, the doors of the hangar opened. And uh, what he described as this aeroplane was actually pushed on to the runway. It was approximately 25 feet in diameter. It had some sort of glass cockpit, like a dome. And he said he could see the thing rotating. I asked him, you know, could you see propellers or jets? And he said, no. Even after the war, the government continued to investigate the Reich's alleged UFO program. The fear was that parties with sinister motives were eager to ensure that the dream of Nazi supremacy could continue to be promoted through the idea of technological superiority. We've definitely got traces here of people with political interests preaching this idea that there were Nazi flying saucers, that they did great things, that the Nazis had technology way superior to ours and the Americans, but they just didn't quite have time to use it before the end of the war. There are claims that they'd flown to the moon and Mars before the end of the war. Hopefully nobody very much believes them, but again they emit from people associated with a very extreme right-wing group in Austria and with bits of the Patriot movement in the States. The transfer of German scientists into America after the war also led to the transfer of scientific secrets. One of the most remarkable projects of the post-war American military bears a striking resemblance to Hitler's flying saucers. I'm absolutely convinced uh, at least parts of the German project was taken for the Avro car. The Avro car was a Canadian-US Air Force joint venture to produce a flying disc, the propulsion system of which would eventually form the basis of the vertical liftoff Harrier jump jet. By the 1950s, the government was certain that they could identify the Nazi flying saucers as little more than exotic engineering projects. But a far greater concern were the unidentified flying objects, the explanation for them. When flying saucers first got here, they were kind of, um, kind of surge of interest. Everyone, everyone got fascinated by them. And for a long time, flying saucers were all the rage. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris, Moscow are key targets. When it was first suggested we might be visited by aliens, I think um, astronomers just chuckled. The whole world is under attack. But then uh, it gradually took hold. It had to be taken, well, more than it had to be taken of it, I suppose. Can it survive? Don't forget, in the 40s and 50s, we didn't know as much as we'd like to about the Mars and Venus particularly. And Venus, we thought, might be a world of oceans and possibly primitive life, or even advanced life. And I think science fiction has had a great influence. People read it and um, took it seriously. And there was widespread panic in America. The United States Air Force set up a research project into this called Project Blue Book. Blue Book was the American military's attempt in the Cold War climate to explain flying saucers. However, not everyone was willing to accept Blue Book's earthly explanations. Among them, Major General Donald Kehoe. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. 
As far as the British were concerned, I think they started more serious ongoing investigations in the late 1940s because they were getting reports from pilots. And then in 1950, following um, the release of America's first two official reports into their secret investigations, which were some of parts of which were declassified, the British government liaised with their United States counterparts in scientific in and technical intelligence and they determined that this was serious enough to set up a top secret, it was called the Flying Saucer Working Party. The British consulted the Americans in formulating the Flying Saucer Working Party. Their findings closely mirrored Project Blue Book's conclusions. It's quite clear that, on the surface at least, they were highly skeptical. The Americans had clearly persuaded them that there was nothing to worry about. 90% of all reports could be explained and the remaining percentage could probably be explained if more information was available. The Flying Saucer Working Party, of course, effectively concluded that um, no UFO sightings uh, really had any exotic explanation and they could all probably be explained in terms of misidentifications. So the recommendation was that no further action be taken on that and, and the, uh, the working party was formally wound up and uh, really that's where uh, certain people involved with the study clearly wanted and expected it to end. When you look at the old files and when you see just the, the caliber of the sorts of people that were getting involved in the debate. You can see that this is not silly season stuff. This went right to the heart of government. The Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, expressed a personal interest in the subject. There had been records released in the public record office about Churchill's interest, and this was triggered by the July 1952 wave of sightings particularly over Washington. We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon, the arrival of a space ship in Washington. Do you believe in flying saucers? Have you any convincing reasons why science fiction shouldn't one day become reality? This triggered worldwide headlines and Churchill demanded to know what's going on, you know, what does all this stuff about flying saucers mean? What does it all amount to? I want to know, and he asked his air staff to give him an explanation. And that explanation is revealed in the files. Prime Minister, don't worry, it's all been explained. We've been in touch with our American counterparts and nearly all sightings can be explained away. The radar cases can be explained by pigeons with metal rings around their legs and so on and so, th so forth. So, Prime Minister, forget it. It's not a serious problem. Very shortly after the Flying Saucer Working Party had concluded that uh, UFOs were of no defence significance and, and uh, the whole matter should be quietly dropped, events took a slightly different turn. Just a minute, ladies and gentlemen. I think something is happening. Around this time, there were a series of dramatic close encounters between Air Force pilots and UFOs. What made these reports fascinating was that they were often corroborated by radar evidence. The combination of the two meant that the Ministry of Defense were faced with a threat that had to be taken seriously. I came here to give you these facts, but if you threaten to extend your violence, this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. The public were not yet really aware uh, that the Ministry of Defence was, was in this game at all, so we probably didn't have that many reports coming in from the public, whereas down Air Force chains, standard operating procedures were beginning to be put out, uh, actively encouraging uh, air crew who saw something to report it. At air bases around the country, reports of UFOs came flooding in. The witnesses were often some of the RAF's most accomplished pilots. The 21st of October, 1952, a date indelibly printed in my mind. Michael Swinney was based at RAF Little Risington, training the top forces pilots to become instructors. 
he was expecting to make a routine flight with one of his students. It was round about um, 12, 13, 14,000 feet. We broke through um, some cloud uh, with nothing above. Fairly soon after that, I was uh, rather horrified to see framed in the front windscreen of the meteor three circular white objects. Mick Swinney in the front suddenly said, is your oxygen connected? I said, Mick, we've just done the um, 30,000 foot check and you checked that your oxygen was all right and I told you that mine was, uh, what's the problem? He said, well, take a look straight ahead. And I looked straight ahead and there were three very bright dots. My immediate reaction was three people coming down in parachutes and they're right in front of the aircraft. So I, in fact, uh, took the control to turn the aeroplane away from the, what I perceived to be, perhaps, a dangerous situation. As we went towards them, they, of course, got closer in that instead of being all in the small direct vision window, they were now above the uh, windshield and either side of the windshield. They definitely did move. Now, they, I remember this quite clearly. They moved across us from uh, left to right, port to starboard. They were um, circular, um, perfectly circular, but looking up at them, as one got higher, which we, we continued on in the climb, they lost their circular shape and took on more or less a flat plate effect, which is what you would get if you bring a saucer down from above eye level down. You will then just get a flat plate. Unbeknown to Swinney and Crofts, on the ground flight control had just detected three mysterious objects and were beginning to plot their movements. I said to Mick, let's, let's go and find out what they are. And he said, no, something like that happened on the west coast of America and the pilots uh, were never seen again and the airplane was believed to have been vaporized. And uh, so we didn't do that. But uh, he then called base. So I called them up and I simply told them my call sign and said that uh, we had three unidentified objects uh, and asking for assistance. I have to admit, and I don't mind admitting it, and I've always admitted it, that I was somewhat scared, frightened by what I was witnessing. Ground control was unable to offer any explanation. As the UFOs continued to move about the sky, it seemed as though they were toying with the pilots. These objects, um, which were, as I say, by then to the starboard side, um, and had remained there, during the period of looking at them and looking away to see if by any chance there was some other explanation, when, when one looked back, and this is the trouble, they'd they were nowhere to be seen. As quickly as that. On their return to base, the men were not given their usual reception by their commanding officers. I was told to go to my room and that I was not to go to the mess for tea, that all my meals would be brought, brought to me in my cabin. I wasn't to talk to anyone at all until I had gone back to the wing commander's office the following morning at nine o'clock. We were met 
and we were separated immediately. The man that interviewed me the following morning was in plain clothes. Uh, I had no idea what his rank was. He also told me that um, the objects had been picked up on radar and that uh, they had a ground speed of 600 miles an hour. I was surprised that he said miles an hour and not knots, but um, it perhaps indicated that he was not uh, an aviator. We were asked, incidentally, to draw what we saw, and I think I just drew three ellipses and three dots in a triangle representing the direct vision panel. As well as filling out an official report, Michael Swinney recorded the incident in his logbook, which he keeps to this day. I console myself by saying that uh, I know I saw something, and thank goodness there was somebody else to corroborate uh, what I had seen. I've often been asked, what do you think they are? And I have to answer, I really haven't got the vaguest idea. I wish I had. Today, the reports have vanished without explanation. The only document that remains is the flight squadron's record book. Michael Swinney was told that their actual reports into the incident had been shredded after five years, in line with government policy. During the course of 1952, many similar incidents were reported, and the government responded by setting up a new secret project. Now, this project has run out of a number of different offices over the years, most famously room 801 in the old Metropole Hotel on Northumberland Avenue. The main unit of the British government charged with investigations in the early 1950s was the Deputy Directorate of Intelligence Technical, DDI Tech. There were several people employed full-time, despite denials at that time by the Air Ministry that anyone was employed in investigations, but apparently there was a huge map on the wall with colored drawing pins. Only credible reports of flying saucers were sent to room 801. In response, UFO investigators were dispatched to interview the witnesses. Although their existence was denied at the time, their findings form some of the most incredible documents ever published by the British government. One report sent to the government's secret UFO headquarters in room 801 was from a 16-year-old girl in Somerset. The files revealed that from the window of her parents' home, she had witnessed a strange craft emitted an eerie, glowing light. I said to the family I'd sent off a letter, and they said, oh, well, nothing will come of it. No, that's, that's nothing. And uh, then I was most surprised to get a letter back saying that they were going to send a gentleman to see me. I felt quite chuffed, to be honest, that uh, I was somebody was coming to see. Anyway, this, this chap turned up, and to my disappointment, he didn't have a uniform on. I, I just thought he would be from the RAF and would be in uniform, but he wasn't. I think it's quite interesting to speculate that when somebody from the Ministry of Defence perhaps knocked on someone's door and said, I've come here to uh, talk to you about your UFO sighting, and I'm sure these people would be smartly dressed, probably in dark suits, um, and it, it seems to me that this is uh, the genesis of the, uh, the so-called men in black. I can't remember if he had an identification. I think he must have done, because I'm quite sure my mother wouldn't have let me see a strange man without being pretty sure he was somebody. Um, but he, if I remember rightly, he wore a dark suit. He came in a dark car. The mysterious man from the Ministry proceeded to question the young Henson about what she thought she had seen. He wanted to talk to me about the thing, what I'd seen, I described it and he decided he would come back that night to try and see it. And of course it was a cloudy night, so he couldn't see it. <laughs> so he came back 
I think, two or three nights in a row to try and see it. But uh, it was cloudy each time, by which time I was feeling a bit of a fool, to be honest. But anyway, um, he said, well, not to worry. But he said not to say anything to anybody else, because I wasn't quite sure whether there was anything there, and I didn't want to feel a fool, naturally. So he said, you know, don't mention it to your school friends or anything. And when you're 16, at that, in that time, you didn't. These investigations were carried out by... Air Force Special Investigators from the Provost and Security Services. Now, the Provost and Security Services are the RAF police. Their special duties include counterintelligence. Well, I don't suppose that uh, we've tried to silence anyone about UFOs, but then, having said that, uh, back in those Cold War days, there, there probably was a, a request, perhaps, not to talk about things too much. I think it's, it's just the culture of the times. I didn't hear anything for some time and then eventually a letter came to say that I had discovered, if I remember rightly, a new planet which I was well chuffed about but they gave it a number and I remember thinking why didn't they call it after me because they call other planets after people who discover them, why, why give mine a number? It may have been easy for the Ministry to dismiss the claims of a schoolgirl but it would not be so easy to pull the wool over the eyes of the royal family. In the mid-1950s, the Duke of Edinburgh began taking a keen interest in the subject of UFOs. Fortunately for him, his personal equerry, Sir Peter Horsley, was also a high-ranking military man who had access to some remarkable contacts and astonishing information. He was at one time investigating UFO reports in the main operations centre at the Ministry of Defence um, as part of his duties and he gave some of these reports to the Duke of Edinburgh. Knowing how the household works, if Prince Philip wanted some information, the natural chap to ask would have been his query. And so he may have said to uh, Peter Horsley, find out what you can about these UFOs, for heaven's sake. I keep reading about them, which he would then have done. He did have uh, an interest in this. I wouldn't say it was a consuming one or a permanent one, but he asked one or two questions, which, of course, got prominence really out of proportion to their actual worth, simply because he was the Duke of Edinburgh. Horsley, in his role as Deputy Chief of Strike Command, had his finger on the clear trigger. One day a colleague by the name of General Martin telephoned him and asked him to go to the Chelsea home of a curious woman by the name of Mrs. Markham. She was playing host to a Mr. Janus, a man who had something of the utmost importance that needed to be discussed with Horsley in person. Intrigued, he left the palace on a wet and misty night, taking a path that was to lead to an extraordinary encounter. As he thought it might have something to do with the royal family, he went. And he was sitting in this flat, which was apparently a well-furnished, quite nice flat and a good address, when in came a chap whom he'd never seen before in his life. He was uh, not by any means inquisitive, but he was a, a very keen, intelligent man, and he and Horsley had a very interesting talk. Their conversation covered UFOs and atomic warfare. He made it clear to Horsley that he knew a great deal of things which Horsley knew, but which were secret, perhaps even top secret. Janus's knowledge sent a shiver down Horsley's spine. He knew all Britain's nuclear secrets at that time. So obviously he found this very disturbing, and the first thing he did was to report it to Buckingham Palace when he went back to the palace. When the Duke heard about the case, the strange encounter was considered to be a security risk. Horsley was immediately dispatched to the house in Chelsea, to question Janus again. When he went back to the address, it had uh, become quite different, not at all what he'd seen on the night in question. The room had been vacated, apparently. There was, he could not find the person with whom he'd been at the meeting. 
and of course the guy from elsewhere had disappeared as well so it was it remained a mystery but it was very disturbing for him this was an astounding experience related by a man whose integrity is beyond question for Horsley the most chilling aspect of the encounter was the feeling that Mr. Janus was reading his mind. This led the royal equerry to a startling conclusion. Horsley had said that the man was, no question about it, an alien. He believed implicitly that he'd had this encounter. I can assure you that he would not have recorded it if it were not so. By no means would he have made up such a story. He would have been frightened of being uh, ridiculed. Horsley later recounted the story in his autobiography, written shortly before his death, but the government file on the incident remains classified and unavailable to the public. Another leading figure whose interest in UFOs is recorded in the files is the Queen's cousin, Earl Mountbatten. He was a great enthusiast about anything, and so it was a very exciting and a very thrilling idea. I mean, you couldn't have a much more thrilling idea. He'd always hoped to see something, and he never did. He was ready to believe anything, but he hadn't made up his mind. One day, a bricklayer from Romsey, who worked for Mountbatten, had a close encounter on the Earl's own doorstep. A workman coming up to Broadlands uh, had been knocked off his bicycle um, by... Um, a flying saucer that had landed, and he had been sort of paralyzed by a, a, a ray gun. He'd been stunned, of course. Extraordinary, extraordinary. Then my father got him to sign a written statement because he thought, you know, if this was going to be true, it would be very important to have a, a witness statement. The files reveal that Briggs offered to swear on a Bible that his story was true. Mount Batten was thrilled by Briggs's experience. However, Briggs soon began to embellish his story, adding that he had been taken on a trip to the pyramids. By this time, there was a sort of lot of whispering going on round the back, and that sort of gradually came up to the front. Briggs's tale began to unravel, and his lie was quickly exposed. It was found out that actually the man had been terribly late for work and had thought, oh, now what excuse? Oh, I know, Lord, my baton's interested in flying saucers. I'll have been stunned by a flying saucer, which was a brilliant excuse. There have been many UFO hoaxes, but previously unseen files report the recovery of physical evidence from a potato and barley field in Wiltshire in 1963. The Charlton Crater case has become known as the British Roswell. He was on his way to work at six o'clock in the morning because he was a milker. He worked for um, Mr. Blanchard, he was on his bike going round that way. And uh, that's what he said to me, you know. He said there was this great big bang in the morning after the huge light in the sky came down and this thing came straight down, you know. And it was just this bang. He thought it was um, something coming down, you know, uh, just a light, as though something, flames were coming out the bottom of something. That's what he thought it was. All it was is just left the, sco uh, the um, scorch marks from the ground. Len Jolliff alerted his boss to the strange incident and they went to examine the alleged landing site in the farmer's field. We found this crater in the field about two foot deep and about um, the hole in the middle where you could put a walking stick down through and the, the lit hedge behind. Uh, the leaves were scorched brown. When we first found it, it was just as though you'd pressed a saucer into some sand. It was about six feet across, and it was just sort of a shallow indent. I suppose it was, could have been a foot deep from the centre of the hole to the top of the saucer shape. It definitely looked as though something had landed. What else would make this six foot across or five, six foot across saucer shape thing with this 
little hole in the middle. We reported to the police, then they sent out the army. When we came up, then they started digging to see what was happening. And I think they went down about oh, three foot more. They put a ba uh, board barricade right around the whole area. They wouldn't let us near. They shored all the sides up so that people couldn't see inside. And there was a big danger sign out by the front there, you know, keep out. They certainly wouldn't let anybody look in the hole. They had guards on the site all night because otherwise, I mean, there were people going up and down the road and, you know, wanting to come and have a look. And they were digging for, oh, for about nearly over a week. The Charlton incident remains one of the very few cases that has ever revealed any physical evidence that the army were not forthcoming about their discoveries. Back in the 50s and 60s, anything which was of interest to the army or the Air Force or the Air Ministry, as it was then called, um, they did tend to be rather secretive about it. If they didn't know what had happened, if there was a mystery, they hated ever to admit that they didn't know. And that's why they used to occasionally put out um, really very silly explanations to what people had seen, which simply didn't fit the facts. There have, of course, been stories of flying saucers and spacecraft. What do you yourself think of this? Well, it's something that we've never come across before with the bomb disposal, but we're treating it now as a strictly unexploded bomb report. The media began putting pressure on the Ministry to find some answers to what had really happened. This barley and potato field at Charlton near Charlton has provided considerable interest and bewilderment. A crater was discovered there the other day by farmer Roy Blanchard. Around it, the buds and the barley had completely disappeared. Not burnt or blasted, just disappeared. Do you think the army knows what they are? Well, I don't think they've got the faintest idea what this really. <laughs> There's something very strange. I mean, uh, it must have been uh, something that landed vertically and took off again and, uh, and left its marks. After a week of digging, the army brought in reinforcements who came equipped with the latest technology. Detectors gave positive readings of a metallic object below the surface. Was some bug-eyed monster lurking down below? I don't know what to think, but it's so unusual. We've got to carry on investigating because we're getting some readings down the hall, you see. What sort of readings are you getting? Well, it's the reading that we get that uh, says that there's something metallic down there. Whether it's a bomb, we don't know. Whether it's from outer space, we just wouldn't like to see it. As a result of all this digging, they did unearth a fairly small object, which probably weighed, it was a metal object, which weighed less than a pound and appeared to be um, fused metal. They didn't place much uh, importance on that. They said, well, this is just a, a lump of ironstone, which you could dig up in just about any field in the south of England. So we're not really sure that has uh, very much to do with the whole thing. With a piece of ironstone dismissed as a naturally occurring rock, the cause of the whole remained a riddle. Questions were even asked in Parliament. They never offered any satisfactory explanation as to what really did happen. So my grandfather, I mean, he believed it was a flying saucer, and I think we all did. There was just some, something suddenly landed in your field, and this beautiful shape, which was absolutely beautifully, you know, as clear as anything, and he poked his walking stick down in the middle, and yes, I think we all believed it really was a flying saucer. Today, there are huge sections of the Charlton Crater case file unavailable to the public, sections that will remain classified for at least the next 30 years. Our visitors from outer space... Most files come under a rule that means the government can keep them out of the public domain for a period of between 30 and 100 years, depending on the document sensitivity. For this reason, the majority of the files end in the 1960s. There is, however, one remarkable exception to this rule. The file on the Rendlesham Forest case of 1980 was released after information on the incident leaked and the story became too great for the Ministry of Defence to contain. In the summer of 1980, I was assigned to RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge, the twin base complex in East Suffolk, England, as the deputy base commander. On the morning of December 26th, I stopped by the police operations centre and talked to the desk sergeant, and when I walked in, the sergeant started to laugh and told me uh, I wouldn't believe what had happened the night before. I said, try me or something to that effect. And he said three of the young security policemen had been out in the woods chasing a UFO all night. And we kind of had a snicker. There had to be some explanation for this. And we really didn't think that awful much about it at that time. 
Two nights later, the head of base security rushed into Holt's office with an ashen look on his face. And he said, it's back. And we all looked at each other, what's back? He said, the UFO is back. And we stood there rather puzzled. So I said, well, I'll go. And I went home and changed clothes and put a utility uniform on, and got my tape recorder, contacted disaster repair and had the on-call officer come with us. And we went out into the forest with a security policeman. The whole time I was using my small micro cassette recorder and recording, now I turned it off and on because I only had 20, 25 minutes worth of tape on it. 150 feet or more from the expected impact point. This is the actual audio recording that Holt made in the forest on the night. We found a small blast, what looks like a blasted or scrubbed up area here. We got very positive reading. It was eerie, so quiet. And at one point, all the farmer's animals, the pigs, the cows, and chickens, and everything, were all acting up, making an awful lot of noise, as though they were being disturbed or frightened. We're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmer's barnyard animals. They're very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. As we were making notes and looking at things there, the lieutenant suddenly looked out and saw something on, in the sky, not in front of us. You just saw a light yes, where? Sir, where? Where? Right on this position here. Straight ahead, in between the tree. There it is again. As we watched it, it appeared like an eye. It was oval and it blinked. It had a black center. Okay, we're looking at the thing. We're probably about two to three hundred yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you. Still moving from side to side. You know, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. Something like a burning molten metal was dripping off the object. This is with the whole it again. And it just moved to the right. Yeah. Off the right. Strange. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. Weird. It, it, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. Yes, it's brighter than it has been. Yeah. It's coming this way. Awesome. It is definitely coming this way. We watched it probably for maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. Suddenly the object very silently exploded and broke into small white objects and they immediately disappeared. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. Take the flashlights off. Here's something very, very strange. Let's, let's approach to the edge of the woods up there. Can you want to do without lights? Let's do it carefully, come on. The object to the south came toward us at a very high speed stopped and was sending down beams, but I would say now, I didn't know at the time, something like a laser beam. Oh, hey, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. A continuous beam it did not get larger as it radiated forth. One of the beams landed almost immediately at our feet, caused us great concern. We didn't know whether it was trying to warn us, whether it was shooting something at us, or trying to signal or communicate with us. It stayed on for, I can't say, maybe five, ten seconds, and just as abruptly as it came, it disappeared. 330, Zero 330, and the objects are still in the sky, although the one to the south looks like it's losing a little bit of altitude. We're turning around and heading back toward the, the base. After returning to base, Holt immediately wrote a report on the strange events in the forest, forwarding it to his superiors he expected a full investigation into what he had witnessed to follow. The significant document in, in the whole of the Rendlesham file has to be the first document in the file, which was the memorandum sent to the Ministry of Defence by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. With regard to the Rendlesham Forest case, I think the way in which the information came out, um, yes, to some people, it, it probably looked a bit uh, uh, suspicious. I mean, it's a very important document, and the Ministry of Defence denied that they had this document. Colonel Holt's famous memorandum uh, was actually released uh, not in, in Britain, but actually under the American Freedom of Information Act. Um, so that looked a bit odd. When the incident happened, the Ministry of Defence denied that there was such an incident. They also denied that they had any file on the case. I think the problem here is, is not uh, 
conspiracy, it's bureaucracy. You see, the uh, division responsible for handling UFO investigations um, has constantly changed over the years, and uh, the ministry is always having uh, reorganizations, and some of the files, for a time, became lost. In reality, the ministry held a file that contained hundreds of documents, but the powers that be came to the conclusion that the incident was of no defense significance. But some leading military figures do not accept this. There are only two conceivable explanations for what happened. Either a UFO landed there, causing the damage and collateral business which I have already mentioned, or the deputy commander of a United States nuclear-armed air base in Britain and several hundred of his men were hallucinating. Now, I put it to you, I put it to anybody with an atom of common sense. Either of those explanations, and they are the only two possible explanations, must be of defense interest. Don't tell me otherwise. Having consistently denied ever investigating UFOs, to date almost 10,000 government files have been made available to the public out of an estimated quarter of a million. What we've actually seen in terms of the reports released uh, to the Public Record Office, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are UFO files that have not yet been released, but uh, you shouldn't read anything into that. It's not as if these are being deliberately held back. Since 1947, information about UFOs has been classified at various levels. Confidential secret, top secret. What is not recognized is that the findings about UFOs have been classified at an above top secret level. And unless you have access to that compartment, you will not find out what's going on. I haven't any doubt that there is a deliberate cover-up, and I'm not uh, sure quite who is responsible. Sightings of UFOs continue, and the government continues to deny carrying out investigations into them. These sightings, the best of the best, will simply uh, remain on the file. Object unexplained, case closed, case closed, case closed, case closed. Coming up next tonight on Five. The initial evidence that possibly sprites were responsible for the disaster. You know, these had been sort of benign, friendly things to study and now they might have serious implications.